everyone, so we can get started. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nicole DePaul and Dr. Robin Hansen for being here with us today. Both of you are gonna bring some insights and a very with very different perspectives, I think, on um, current issues that are, I think, important for all of us right now. One is the environment, and then another one is um, um, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. all related to our current context. So um, with us too, you will bring some incredible experience and, and, and know-how, so we are very lucky to have you today. And the, Professor Isana, who's there with us as well, she's going to be helping us with uh, moderating the discussion. And with us too is Professor Carolina Rizzo, and she is the director of the master's program in development for the Faculty of Finance, Government, and International Relations. I um, have to continue welcoming people as I chat, so excuse me. Um, we'll ask each of you to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have answers at the end, questions and answers at the end, I mean. And, um, we had originally at one point, one of the, uh, on the website, I think it says this is for two hours. Really, we think that a webinar like this, um, an hour is, is probably plenty. Those of you who want to stay afterwards and keep, um, uh, keep the discussion alive, that's fine too. But about an hour, I think, should be fine. So we expect to be here about until 10 o'clock or so. Um, also, just to, I think a lot of, all of us have been in a million Zoom sessions by now, but yes, I, uh, you have your mics off, so thank you very much. We'll have your mics off during the session, so we don't have as much noise. And, um, and if you have any questions at the end, we'll use the chat box, and we'll welcome also if you want to raise your hand and, and, and speak and um, give any opinions. So without further ado, um, Isana, do you want to head... We're going to continue then and introduce our first guest, please. Okay. Welcome to this conference, which is organized by the Master's Program in Development Studies in the School of Arts and Culture and Language and the Faculty of, International Rel of Finance, International Relations and Government at External University here in Bogota, Colombia. This conference uh, is, to be, is being organized in conjunction between these two areas of our faculty. Our guests today are Do Dr. Nicole De Paula and Professor Robin Hansen. Dr. Nicole De Paula, uh, we came across her, uh, both, of, well, both professors through their extensive work and studies in the area of development studies and economics, and in the case of Professor Hansen, uh, artificial intelligence, which we will see COVID-19 has brought all of these to a tangential point today. Dr. Paula holds a PhD in international relations from Science Po uh, uh, University in Paris. She's currently the first class Toffer Sustainability Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Potsdam, Germany. As a planetary health advocate, she champions the socioeconomic advancement of women through environmental conservation. She's the founder of the Women Leaders for Planetary Health and is currently uh, co-organizing the global meeting of the Planetary Health Alliance to be held in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo in April, 2021. Previously, she's, uh, her work in Germany uh, in her journey, she was director of a think tank in Thailand, hosted by the Madol University of the Faculty of Public Health. In addition, Dr. Paula is also a team leader and writer for the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, uh, published by the International Institute for Sustainable Development. She has some very interesting articles that have come up relating issues of paradigms and COVID-19. She has been working for over a decade with organizations the United Nations with a focus on biodiversity and climate. Dr. DePaul uh, has also worked for the European Research uh, Project, RAMSIS, which oversees climatic change in addition to being a fellow at the Johns Hopkins University and London School of Economics and Political Science as part of the Global Public, uh, Public Policy Network. It's an honor to have you with us, Professor. 
our, our second guest, um, who is no stranger to Externado University, is Professor Robin Hansen, who frequently appears on TED Talks. Um, we came across Professor Robinson through uh, Hansen through his works, which were read in several classes at the undergraduate and the postgraduate level at Externado University in the Faculty of Finance, Government, and International Relations. Professor Hansen is an Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University in the United States. He is also a professor at Oxford University, and he's a Research Associate at the Future of Humanity Institute of Oxford. Professor Hansen is, as I said, he's no stranger to our university. He has never actually been in Bogota, but he has spoken about five or six times so far to different student groups. He has a doctorate in social science from the California Institute of Technology, a master's degree in physics and philosophy from the University of Chicago, and he has worked as a pro programmer at Lockheed and NASA. So he has a very strong social science and natural science background, which we, we, will, uh, we will hear today. He's a widely published and cited scholar in the areas of future economies, artificial intelligence, information systems, and innovation studies. His book, which was published by Oxford University, is titled The Age of EM, Work, Love, and Life, When Robots Rule the Earth. Um, in 2018, in addition to all his scientific articles, he had another book published called The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life which was co-authored with Kevin Simler in January 2018. He has been very generous to us. Uh, I, I recall a couple of years ago, uh, I had asked, invited him to speak to a class and he was off to a TED talk. Uh, and I, he said uh, that he would kind of see if he can fit us in. He has never said no to us. So we really appreciate both of your uh, time and accepting our invitations. Okay, so we will proceed as Maite said in the following format. Um, we will start with Dr. Nicole de Paula, who will be talking about development paradigms and uh, in this age, day and age of COVID, she'll probably uh, focus on the issue of health, which is one of her areas. After she has spoken, we will proceed to listen to Dr. Robin Hansen, who will also be talking about development and paradigms, but for more of a focus in the area of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Finally, we will have questions related to these topics, which Maite will be uh, coordinating through the chat. Okay, so welcome again, and we will proceed with Dr. Nicole de Paula. Well, thank you for this generous introduction. It's a very a pleasure. Buenos dias. I will not, it's a great guitar speak English because I don't want to bore you with my portuñol, but perhaps one day I need to spend some time in Bogota to improve that. Uh, I think it's quite shameful that uh, I should be a better by now being neighbors. So it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, in my 20 minutes, uh, I, think, uh, I think we're gonna have some time for the discussion uh, to really focus on the COVID situation and based on the questions I can tackle also more on these issues of culture and language. But I would like to uh, share my screen here and I will focus on the theme of planetary health. Um, please let me, I think, if you can all see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. So here we go. Um, yes. So Klaus Stafford, just for those who don't know, he's, a, he's the founder of ISS here in Potsdam, and he's also former Minister of Environment in Germany and former head of UNEP. So it's a really, uh, this fellowship here, it's a place where we can uh, bring together uh, policymakers and uh, scientists. So it's really about bridging the gap. So I wanted to bring you to the world of, and to the language of planetary health. Uh, and I think in times of COVID, this is a very necessary uh, discussion that we're going to have. So 
here, uh, one of the issues that, how did we start? And I think uh, we'll uh, guide you through this story of this um, field and uh, social movement, is that humanity, if you see, uh, we have made uh, tremendous progress in terms of public health in the, in the last decades. We are all living longer. We have global child mortality uh, reducing. So we have uh, many um, aspects of our lives that ha have improved. But on the other hand, and that's, I think, the difference that we are seeing is that at the same time, um, this progress uh, has come with a very uh, high price tag. And we're probably seeing nowadays, we are all sitting at home. It's also connected to this high price tag that we are paying by destroying uh, nature. So uh, one of the things that planetary health does, we are concerned about human health in the Anthropocene, in this era where we humans are being more disruptive than geological forces, in a sense. So this list is, brings us a few, some of the you know, examples that we, we talk about, or the change that we humans are causing to our planet, uh, mainly connected to biodiversity degradation, uh, changing biogeochemical flows. We have a big change um, in land use and land cover. And of course, global pollution. So I like this photo. Oh, Nicole, I think we I lost our voice for a minute. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Back? All right. See, I, I'm receiving a message that my connection is um, unstable, but just please send me a message, something happens. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I was just mentioning that it would be very hard to sustain life on Earth if we have this type of um, uh, resources and, for example, land and cell destructed. Here, what we call the great acceleration. It doesn't matter if we are measuring uh, fertilizer use, uh, transportation, water use. It's just a nice illustration to see how our consumption patterns uh, before and after 1950 went up so dramatically. And, and that's a, a very, the, probably connected to this exponential growth in population and the world GDP. So it's, it's another way to illustrate that at the same time that we are, uh, so-called the progress that we are seeing, we are having uh, probably taking a toll in human health right now. So uh, human impacts on natural systems, another graph that also illustrates the, what we call the great acceleration. We have, um, of course, a big loss in tropical forest, this carbon cycles, probably in the media, we're much more connected to the problem of climate change. But I think my task today is really bringing the connections we have through this uh, massive environmental degradation. So, and that's exactly what I said uh, here, it's just to a few other points that uh, as an ecosystem, uh, the climate change is really something that potentialize and make other problems that we are seeing uh, so much worse. So, if we have, for example, uh, sea levels that are rising, so many vulnerable uh, populations uh, exposed to, uh, to this problem, uh, land use and you know, soil, air, we have probably nowadays an estimate that um, probably seven to eight million people per, per year are dying of air pollution. Uh, and this is not only, we tend to think that the, the air pollution is something that is killing you know, in Beijing and it's a problem of the Far East in, in Delhi. And this is really happening even in London or Frankfurt. Um, so that's something that is not so much ingrained in the, in the mindset of people. So um, this global environmental change that I was mentioning with this great acceleration and um, you know, our exponential uh, consumption patterns is affecting our health. So what planetary health does is like how exactly we are uh, affecting our health by this environmental destruction. This list here gives some examples so human health impacts include not limited to the, the number of cardiovascular, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, as I mentioned, infectious zoonotic diseases, which is really also the case of COVID-19 that we are seeing. Uh, I think at the beginning when the pandemic started, we didn't hear so much the connections to the degradation of nature. Uh, uh, and when we have, for example, wildlife losing their own space they're also becoming refugees in a sense. We have women, uh, people who are just escaping, you know, uh, um, uh, poverty and uh, or natural disasters. But when you have also animals, uh, even before COVID, we had this big crisis 
in Australia, and and I think this image of animals, you know, uh, completely um, without their own habitat around the um, that area. So that's a problem. Heat strokes. It's another issue that is being. If you were, for example, in Europe in 2003, and I remember uh, being in France at that time, uh, we had around 70,000 people dying. Uh, from uh, heat strokes and obviously like in COVID-19 uh, when we are seeing we have the, the, the most vulnerable populations, the elderly, being uh, most affected by it. So what planetary health does is really, this is a, a graph that shows that what we need is a system thinking. Uh, and, and we have, so the consumption demographic shifts here on the left. And when we, the things that we can really do are this part here when we call the mediating factors. And that's why it's important to not only bring uh, science uh, alone, will not bring the change that we need to, 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 to have the solutions for, for planetary health um, policies, but also for the public, the big public emergency health that we are uh, seeing today with this pandemic. It's not only having the solutions or having more hospitals or having uh, better doctors. We know that we are being disrupted in a, so, in a holistic way. And how do we do that? Because I think today is really um, not only about um, finding these problems, but how do we get to the solutions? So if you're really interested in the theme of planetary health, I would recommend that you follow, this is the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. That's the landmark report in 2015 that brought to life uh, this uh, field of planetary health. And that's a quote. So across this, pre uh, this presentation, we have a few quotes that we have um, in this one, we say we have mortgaged the health of future generations to realize economic and development gains in the present. And perhaps, one of the most uh, important questions that we have, and even now with this crisis, is not only how, what are we doing to secure the rights of the future generations, it's not only for us. So, planetary health is now an uh, evolving scientific field. We have a few universities uh, that is actually, this number is growing, of creating professorships of planetary health. And that's a very interesting uh, information. We have the University of Oxford, we have the University of Sydney, University of Harvard with professors on planetary health. So it's a new field, uh, but it's also, and that's the part that I um, particularly enjoy is that it's, it's growing as a social movement and a community engagement activity. Because we know that uh, we, are, we depend uh, on these natural systems to thrive and on the future. So we need also, it's not only to inform, but we need to get mobilized. So planetary health, it's coming from, um, of course, it focuses uh, very much on human health. It's a movement that uh, probably gained force coming from the public health sector, contrary to other um, past initiatives that also inform uh, uh, this movement like uh, One Health or Eco Health. Uh, they were uh, probably a bit stronger among uh, people working, of, for example, veterinarians or uh, ecologists. So um, we are, then moving forward, let's hear another quote that humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves and all things are bound together. All things connect. How do we show these connections? So what, what needs to happen actually to achieve the planetary health? So it's not only the human health, right? So, so far the, this concept needs, tells us that we need the health ecosystems to have healthy people. So we need a great transition and we need to learn to do everything different. And I think that COVID-19 is kind of showing us that we need to learn to do everything differently. Uh, it's, there's nothing that we used to do that kind of works now. So I think planetary health uh, communities was already quite prepared for this pandemic uh, because we do need to learn how we produce and consume food, how we manufacture our products differently? How do we uh, change our supply chains to be completely sustainable? Uh, how we construct uh, smart cities? How, how will be the cities in the future? Or how do we adapt the old ones? How we manage our natural landscapes and resources? Uh, we know now with this pandemic, the huge disruption and the problems with uh, food security. Um, for example, we in big cities, we are continuing to go to the supermarkets, some products might uh, be missing, but if that's not the reality of so many countries, um, for example, when you think about small islands, 
um, they are not, most of the food in, the, in, in many of these countries are imported. And with this disruption, that's a, a very big problem that of course affects their health. So we need to understand that uh, when you say there's a problem well stated is a problem half solved because if we don't understand these connections, we're probably gonna find a good solution. So this great transition will require both innovation, and I think that's a topic, of course, that connects to technology. We're going to talk today about that. But it's um, above all about, about collaboration, and it's about many, so, many sectors that need to be involved in this. And on this right here, I have this little list. So it's about policy and governance. It's about business and economics. Of course, you need natural scientists and, and uh, you know, hard science to solve all of this. You need the public health sector. But you probably need the faith leaders, the indigenous communities and traditional knowledge, uh, how the technology uh, companies and leaders will do that, how art and humanities can help us to uh, communicate this message to a broader public, because of course, we're not gonna do, uh, do this and solve this problem alone. So it's really about you know, changing the way we think. So another quote here is we cannot solve our problems with the same thing we used when we created them. Uh, and, and this will take all of us. And that's a topic when we talk to many of our efforts, um, they remain really fragmented. And, and that's what concerns me personally. One of the things that I'm trying to do now in, in my own research is how do we break the silos for planetary health? How do we bring these sectors and people who don't communicate, who don't want to communicate uh, uh, together? So, and that's how the Planetary Health Alliance comes into place. Uh, I wanted to share what, uh, what is the Planetary Health Alliance for those who are not familiar with. And so it is a community created in 2016, uh, following that report that I mentioned from the Rockefeller Foundation and Lancet. Uh, we have now more than 200 institutions. There are academic uh, institutions, NGOs, governments, but also, and now present uh, in more than 40 countries. What I think is important, I'm very pleased to be with you all this morning, is that I do think we need to have more people from Latin America represented in this community. So far, we see a strong weight of uh, countries like Canada, United States, uh, Germany, where I, uh, where I am right now, big interest in the topic and growing very fast, Australia. And how do we bring more people from the global south to to tackle these problems that we are seeing. And of course, uh, it's above all, it's not only about the environmental, we, need, we talk about the social aspects of it. So just to share a little bit of the history uh, of this alliance, how it evolved, um, and I've been working with them since, I'm not officially representing the Planetary Health Alliance, I'm part of the alliance, and, uh, and you, but this year particularly active because, so, so in perspective, in 2015, that's when the report that I mentioned was launched, and this secretary now, the, the team of the Planetary Health Alliance sits at the Harvard University, and it's hosted by these two schools, Harvard University Center for the Environment, and also the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. So that's where they are physically hosting the secretariat. In 2017, this is how the community started to gain track, and we, were, we all went to Boston, and this first meeting happening um, at Harvard. Second meeting, 2010, we went, to, we went to Edinburgh, and then we went to Stanford. And this shows exactly my argument previous that it still remains a very a North uh, movement that we need to bring it to other regions where probably this, uh, the populations are even more vulnerable to this environmental degradation. So what is uh, happening is that Brazil, I'm very proud, we got the right to host the next Global Summit for the Planetary Health Alliance. And that's why I'm so involved with them uh, nowadays. Uh, of course, this meeting is scheduled for April, 2021. And who knows if you know, this planet will be, if we'll be alive by then. But uh, regardless, if it's a virtual meeting or a physical meeting, uh, what we do want is to have a huge representation from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So I really invite all of you to uh, contribute to this effort. And here's a quote from a futurist also that said, our challenge is to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. It's really about being inclusive. So the Planetary Health Alliance has uh, many ways you can do. There are to, we foster collaboration across disciplines, across schools. Uh, we convene to empower um, new uh, ambassadors, new scholars. There are um, many programs on that. 
Uh, and of course, it's about gathering the science behind that, how, what exactly means when you, climate change is affecting, for example, uh, uh, nutrition and how, how, what happens to the plants that are exposed to climate change. So this type of also new uh, research uh, are being uh, gathered under this alliance. There are key uh, initiatives, key resources that I would invite you to uh, visit if you're interested in. I perhaps, I don't, if the, uh, your school is not yet part of it, perhaps there is a chance there to join this movement. Um, students can enjoy as well because they can become campus ambassadors, they can connect, they can create. We do have a regional hub uh, of the Latin Americas in Brazil, uh, hosted by the University of Sao Paulo that um, I'm co-leading this initiative. So, perhaps we can also do some cooperation with Colombia. So you cannot do all the good the world needs, but the world needs all the good you can do. We need to take a day at a time here. Every uh, effort matters. And if it's possible, I would like to play this uh, quickly, this video, and I think that illustrates uh, what I've just said, but in a nicer image. Planetary health is a very recently emerging field focused on understanding the human health implications of our rapid disruption and transformation of our planet's natural systems. We're really concerned that potentially the majority of the global burden of disease over the next century is going to result from our impacts across our planet's natural systems from our disruption of the climate system of global fisheries of biodiversity loss of accelerating scarcity of fresh water and arable land degradation of changes in biogeochemical cycles and that all of those transformations are accelerating at a pace that threatens every dimension of human health. So we're downstream from the largest industrial project on the planet. So this is tar sands, it's not your sweet crude oil. It's uh, more like peanut butter. And these projects aren't just threatening climate, they're threatening the survival of people. In this case, it's my people. When I saw what was happening in my territory, it's literally like seeing someone destroy a relative because that is who I am. So there's a massive, massive illegal logging going on. And, you know, when I first started, it was really easy to hate those loggers but they just didn't have any choices. They were in these impossible situations where they had to choose between the well-being of their family and the well-being of the natural ecosystem. And they very, very clearly understood that if the forest was protected, it meant less disease for the community and it meant more water for their rice fields. And then those rice fields were feeding their family. So they saw this as a really clear trade-off between short-term and long-term well-being. I've started to wonder whether part of the predicament that we're in isn't a result of renouncing the authority of that awe and reverence that so many of us actually experience toward the natural world. I feel like we've gone pretty far away from that. We need to change our spiritual identity. We need to provide ourselves with spiritual fuel so we can see the earth not just as something physical, but it has a spirit. We somehow seem to have gotten away from talking about values and ethics, but it's something I believe we need to get back to. I think all of us are driven by our sense of values, but we don't talk about our collective shared values as much as we should. The positive vision is, is, is right there for us to see. For my children and their children, it's easy for me to imagine a world in a hundred years where human population has stabilized, where human populations continue to congregate in cities, but where those cities have been designed with intent and with thoughtfulness about how to minimize their inhabitants' ecological footprints and optimize their health and well-being. And it's quite easy to imagine a world in which with every passing decade after that, there is more room for the rest of the biosphere, not less. That to me is every bit as likely a future for my children's grandchildren as the catastrophic future.
And the point is that it all depends on what we decide to do right now today. That's the urgency of now. So this is, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, maybe we can, like I said, you can visit the website and if you're interested in these questions of, of, of gender that I hope we can also discuss later, gender equality, health and sustainability, you can visit Women Leaders for Planetary Health, the org. So I'm happy to take questions and continue this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very you. much, Dr. Nicole de Paula. Um, you shed some light on a lot of issues and challenges to development. Talking with Professor Carolina Rizzo in the development program, one of the issues that they're looking at is paradigms of development. And we're beginning to see that traditional paradigms of development, political economy and economics are becoming increasingly challenged by these issues. Uh, Previously, there was the issue of demographic pressure, Malthusian pressure, et cetera, but we're beginning to see that there are new challenges to our environment, such as these health issues as well. We will now proceed and look at another issue, a very important issue that's uh, up and coming, uh, that has been around, and that is the issue of uh, Professor Robin Hansen, his research in economics and future economies, which he looks at uh, the issue of artificial intelligence. So he's, also, he's going to share some of his ideas and perhaps also look at this in light of COVID-19. Welcome, Professor Hansen. Uh, Professor, you need the mic on. And while you do that, just really quickly in the chat box, it would be great to hear from everyone to see where you're from. Most people are, of course, here in Bogota, but I know that there are people joining us from various places of our planet. So it would be great to, if you type in the chat box where you're joining us from. Okay, continue, Professor Hansen. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, under I wanna first correct uh, the introduction. Uh, I shouldn't allow you to say I'm a professor at Oxford. I am a research associate at an institute at Oxford, but not a professor there. I am a professor at George Mason University. So that's just a correction. Uh, I understand that I've been given the task in 20 minutes to tell you about COVID-19 and about artificial intelligence and about some sort of connection between them. I will endeavor to do that, but it'll have to be brief. So on COVID-19, which is what I've mostly been talking about for the last few months when I've been giving talks or on panels, uh, I have been talking about a uh, plan B. So plan A is to try to contain the disease so that most people don't get infected. And we are well past the point where previous diseases have been contained, but many people are still hopeful that we can do containment and we should still pursue that. Uh, but if we fail, we need a plan B. Uh, plan B is where most everyone gets it. We would definitely want to try to spread it out over time so that not everybody gets accept, infected at the same time, but we would hope we could do better. And I've been exploring the concept of deliberate infection. That is where you choose who gets infected when uh, and that allows you to uh, more uh, efficiently use isolation resources and medical resources and to reach herd immunity through the people getting infected who have the least chance of getting hurt, the young and healthy. And that um, idea has been blocked so far by medical ethics boards, which have not approved a small trial of 100 people for a month to just see what would be a way to produce um, you know, safe infection. Uh, but there's an even bigger payoff there, uh, which is called variolation. Uh, a lar most is viruses, uh, perhaps 75% at least, have what's called a dose effect, whereby if you get a smaller dose of the virus, you have a weaker infection with uh, less severe symptoms. And that's most likely true of COVID, but we need to verify it. And in diseases like SARS, measles, and smallpox, that has reduced death rates by a factor of three to 30. <laughs> And so that could dramatically reduce and, uh, you know, and that would be a helpful plan B. Most people get infected, but they are harmed much less. And uh, in the United States, our uh, George Washington in the Revolutionary War um, deliberately infected his troops at uh, violating the laws of Continental Congress in order to save the troops, reducing the death rate from 20 to 30 percent down to one to two percent uh, and um, thereby al allowing the U.S. to win the Revolutionary War. Uh, so that's mainly what I want to say about 
COVID because I don't have much time here, but I'll, although I'll come back when I try to connect it. So now I'm going to tell you about AI, and then I'll tell you about a connection between COVID and AI. All right. As you may know, uh, we humans work, but we help machines help us. <laughs> and uh, the Industrial Revolution was all about uh, having machines help us, and we've been using machines a lot to help us for a long time. Uh, during the entire industrial era, we've had many bursts of concern about what happens if the machines get so good that they don't just help us, they replace us. And uh, there was a burst of concern like that in the early 1800s at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and some of the most luminary uh, economists and other scholars in the world at the time engaged that issue seriously. And then we are now in the fourth boom of concern after that. <laughs> We had one in the 1930s, one in the 1960s, one in the 1980s, uh, you know, 90s, and one today. And in each burst of concern, we've had people saying, uh, look at these really dramatic new progress uh, demos and abilities. Uh, are we about to have the moment when everything gets automated? And that's been sort of the most dramatic concern the public has latched onto. And we have media, we have presidential panels, we have, uh, you know, a lot of concern. And in each of these booms, we've had somewhat of a burst, uh, a boom of interest in schools, interest in com conferences, interest in the media and investment. And again, we're in the uh, basically the fifth overall boom since the first one in the 1800s, at least, of these concerns. And so the most fundamental question to ask is, are we about, in fact, to see this huge burst in automation uh, deviating from trend? And my basic answer to you is no we're not at the moment about to see a huge deviation from trend. We have seen relatively steady automation and displacement of jobs for the last century or two, and we are already used to that rate of displacement. So if we continue to have that rate of displacement, that will be uh, manageable because we've managed it so far. That rate of displacement is pretty high in the sense that we've doubled the economy every 15 years for a while now. And when you double the economy, you have to change a lot of jobs. So we've had a lot of job displacement every 10, 15 years, because that's exactly what it takes to double the economy. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, with a colleague, uh, did a study of automation and jobs over the last 20 years, looking at uh, all the US jobs and how automated each job is in each year over the last 20 years. And we have data on that. And we could ask, when things get more automated, does pay change or uh, the number of jobs change? And in fact, no. The, the change in amount of automation has not changed pay or number of jobs over the last 20 years on average in jobs in the US. And we can also say, do the things that predict which jobs get automated, have they changed? That is, has there been a change in the character of automation in the last 20 years? And the answer is no. No change in the nature of character or even the rate at which jobs get automated in the last 20 years. So basically, there is not a thing happening now in the economy with respect to automation. We are continuing in the same pattern we have for a century at least. Uh, however, of course, that doesn't mean there won't eventually be huge changes due to automation. So my book, The Age of M, When Robots Rule the Earth, is about the question of what happens when the machines eventually do get capable enough to replace most people on most jobs. Eventually that will happen and eventually it will be a really big deal. Uh, but it's not happening soon and there's no indication that it's just around the corner. Um, so uh, there are several ways that might happen eventually. It could happen through the kind of automation we've seen over the last half century where we basically write code and do things deliberately and do statistics. Or it could happen through a different mechanism, which is what I explore in my book, which is brain emulations. That is, we take human brains and we make compute, we scan them in fine detail. We have good models of how each cell works, and then we make models of entire brains. It's very hard. We're not close to doing it. It may take another century, uh, but it may well happen before we can automate things through other means. And so my book then goes into talking about how the world would change entirely in that scenario. And uh, it is something to be concerned about and think ahead about, but it's not a crisis at the moment, certainly not like COVID. All right, now my last point is, how do I connect AI and COVID? How are these things related? Well, they're not very related on the surface. That is, uh, COVID pushes a bit more for automation, but it's happening way too fast that people could effectively automate in the short time scale. Uh, and it'll be over before, you know, it has enormous impact. But uh, I do see a key relationship. Um, 
the key limitation for most automation that we uh, do is that automation we create isn't very general or abstract or flexible. We can automate particular jobs with particular methods, but when that job or task changes, we have to change the automation. And people are just much more flexible at adapting to different circumstances and learning to do new, new things in new ways. And that has been the human advantage for a long time, which is why humans get most income and why humans are very valuable. And it'll take a long time to make artificial intelligence that flexible in general, although brain emulations, by definition, are exactly as general and flexible as humans because they have exactly the same brain structure and the same mechanism. In COVID-19, I think we are seeing failures of generality and flexibility in our institutions. That is, in general in society, our institutions uh, tend to latch on to their previous environment and assume that things will be the way they have been because that's just a natural thing for humans and institutions to do. We, we learned to fight the last war. We set up regulatory processes for the problems we have had in the past, but when you have a sudden big change, like a big war or a pandemic, that's exactly the time when you test the flexibility and generality of your institutions, not just to apply the rules you've had in the past, but to rethink and reconsider what institutions and methods you have in order to respond to the crisis. And I'd say in the United States especially, we have seen our institutions failing in that route. They have failed to sort of to adapt the circumstance to change regulations or rules for this new situation. And that's unfortunately why variolation trial hasn't even been approved and we may well not get that factor of three to 30 cut in death rates uh, because nobody's ever allowed to try. And I believe <laughs> that gives me a roughly my 20 minutes. I say COVID-19 is a big issue right now. Uh, COVID, uh, we need a plan B for what happens if most people get it. There's a plausible plan B through deliberate infection with low doses, not just low doses, but also perhaps a, a weaker strain and a delivery vector like skin or stomach or throat that uh, has a lower death rate through that delivery vector. Uh, you know, there's a strong likelihood that there's something like there that works better, uh, but we are blocked now because our regulatory institutions have just assumed that we have to keep doing things the way we've been doing. And, you know, as you, as you know, we don't have any vaccine for any coronavirus like this current one. And the fastest we've ever produced a virus is five years. A vaccine has been five years, <laughs> at least in, in recent decades. And unless we are able to adapt to those processes and change them and, and be more flexible, we will basically probably face uh, most people getting infected with this through accidental infection. Artificial intelligence will be slightly pushed by this crisis, but it's not going to be pushed that much because it's a very long-term slow process. Not much has changed in automation and artificial intelligence in the recent decades. Not much is about to change in the next two decades, but eventually there will be enormous change and it would do us all well to prepare and think about that. And that's what I have to say and I look forward to discussion and questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hansen. You shed light on uh, the, the pressures of institutional pressures and the need to rethink our paradigms about institutions under this crisis, and also how some of the human uh, behavior challenges that we tend to um, encounter uh, during these difficult times. Uh, now we will open up this to, there's a message here from Dean Roberto Nestrosa who's very interested in starting a public health area, like a school, as one of the schools that we have that Maite uh, directs, which is arts and languages. So he's also suggested the possibility of even starting a school of related to uh, public health. For Professor Di Paola and Professor Hansen, uh, Externality University is a very social science-based university. So it's interested in uh, venturing into this area of health and public health. And of course, this crisis has even accelerated the challenge. We will now open this to questions, uh, which should be coming in the chat. Uh, so uh, um, there are, I haven't seen any. Maite asked uh, where people are from. Uh, most people here are from Bogota. We have a few people from Michigan. I think there are some people from uh, Germany as well who haven't identified themselves. There's some also from Phoenix, uh, Arizona. And of course, Professor Hansen in Virginia. 
uh, at George Mason University. So we're going to open this to some questions. Uh, if please feel free to write your questions in the chat. Uh, while we wait for some questions, uh, I will probably I like to open a question that's kind of is a personal interest uh, of mine, which is the issue of population and development. Uh, I'd like to ask you both, the whole issue of population and population pressure, the Malthusian pressures that you know, one is taught in you know, elementary development studies, has always been a, a major issue when looking at economic development, growth, etc. Uh, Professor Di Paula talked about some of the issues of, uh, of exponential population growth, but then also looked at some of the environmental issues. Uh, while we uh, wait for some questions, I was wondering if either one of you could shed some light on um, this issue of population growth and how it may be related also to COVID and also to the whole issue of development. I would like just to um, react to a few things that we have been listening. And I think these two talks, they, in a sense, are complementary. We are talking about what I'm trying to convey is a message of prevention. And, and I think uh, my, the next talk that the professor gave was really also what, how, how could we deal with this emergency that we are seeing now? And there are a few techniques. I mean, the responses are different. And one of the, one of the things that is very important, we talk about planetary health or, or development could be the paradigms of development in the end. They still need to be very much localized. So a solution that probably works for the U.S. would not work, uh, you know, for other countries. And, and we know that even the most successful cases for COVID-19, for example, they were different. Uh, the Korea, the, for example, they never really shut down the whole economy. Uh, the Asians uh, had a different approach. Taiwan, six deaths very close to China. So, of course, that this had to do a lot of the political responses that uh, we were having at that point. So um, what is interesting in the U.S. and then, and then politically is that we... Of course, as, a, as we call the liberal global order, we expect a lot of leadership coming from these countries, and we didn't see that uh, in a so explicit way. So on the population, it's a very, it remains, I think, a sensitive topic because people are probably, uh, um, they have this, you know, memory of the way that we dealt with this in the past. I, I'm no expert in this uh, specific talk, but I know that, of course, you know, when you have people uh, just growing, growing, growing a population and we have finite resources, this will be a problem. Um, but we probably don't, um, uh, the sensitivity is that you don't want to go there and say that we're going to have to just control population uh, and, and depends how you do it, right? So uh, it's, uh, I don't know if Professor uh, uh, Hansen has a specific comment on that, but uh, what is important is that when you're trying to uh, whatever policies you're putting in place. Uh, and if you don't have uh, in mind that perhaps the cost you're going to pay now, because right now it's very expensive for whatever policy you're choosing, it's almost too late in many places. Uh, Brazil, my own country, is going through a very difficult uh, uh, situation and basically related to the leadership that we have uh, there. Um, not recognizing the problem, for example, in the first place. So uh, as fast as you can act according to your own context, but also preventively, because what I'm trying to talk about is that it's not about COVID-19, it's that COVID-19, for example, in Asia for this response, they were very much prepared and more sensitive for emergencies because of SARS. So mm -hmm. it took 17 years for, for, from them to at least feel, you know, wearing masks or being uh, careful with others because wearing masks is not only about your own individual health, it's also about the collective. And so these things that, that the mindsets that should change in each country, I think after COVID will be a very interesting thing to observe. But I would like to see this connection to the resources that we have and how do we prevent the next pandemic to, to uh, happen again, because it's not only about about COVID. The, the people knew, I work within uh, epidemiologists, and to be honest, I'm not surprised about this crisis. And people would say, who would have thought that we would have this pandemic? Well, I mean, anyone who was studying this. We have been, I was in a meeting here in the World Health, uh, World Health Summit in October in Berlin. Dr. Tedros, the head of a World Health Organization, said clearly, and I published this in an article uh, called Rethinking the Rules of Reality. You can find an ISS is saying it's not, uh, it's not if we're going to have a pandemic, but when. And 
it took a few months and here we are. So it's not a real surprise. And, and that's, that's why when you have science, and how do you convey this message from science to policymakers? I, I will just weigh in and say uh, that population is not as direct the issue as you, as you might want. That is, uh, there are more people now and uh, there is a larger economy and we are traveling more and interacting more and uh, interacting more with nature. And so all of those things, all else equal, you would expect to make pandemics more of a problem because uh, you know, we spread things around and we're including with animals. Although of course, a larger economy also means we have more technology and methods for dealing with these things. And uh, you know, in a, like a shutdown like this is much less harmful for rich nations when you have a lot more resources than for poor nations. That's why it's good to be rich. Uh, from an economist's point of view, the, the best way to think about the question is in terms of externalities. That is, uh, if you have some resources and you use it and you use them up and you suffer, well, that's your problem. It's when we share resources and that my use of resources affects your opportunities and options that uh, we want to come in and, and you know, have policies to deal with it. So uh, there are many potential externality issues and uh, like that with respect to uh, planetary health, but population per se isn't the problem. It's the, it could exasperate a problem that is caused by these externalities, ways in which we each take action and not, don't take into account the effect of our actions on others. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Dean, Robert, uh, Dean Roberto Inestrosa. His question is about how is the role of multilateral institutions and new institutions as well as leadership going to change in light of this? I think earlier on, Professor Hansen had talked about this challenge. Uh, so uh, our Dean Inestrosa is interested to know about how are the institutions going to change in light of this? Well, let me just weigh in first. <laughs> I'll just okay. say that um, many multilateral institutions are sort of piggyback on more local institutions. If more local institutions need to uh, substantially change, that may well make it harder in the short run to piggyback on them with multilateral institutions. We may need to be rethinking more basic institutions in our society and restructuring them and then re-coordinating with multilateral institutions to adapt to our new more local institutions. Um, I, I, well, and so I guess I had another thought, but I'll, maybe I'll remember it later. <laughs> okay. This will lead us to an, as, talking about institutions. This leads to another question, which is brought up by Professor Sanjay Nanwani. And his interest is in education, in the educational sector. He wonders, uh, what, have you, what have you got to say about how education systems should change? Um, they're changing right now as we work from home. Uh, how should they change? Uh, he's thinking about teacher-student relationships, interactions, and also looking at the quality of education through remote learning, um, what we're doing right now actually, mental health, uh, that's in increased as a result of connectivity and screen-mediated interaction. Uh, we're approaching the end of the semester. I think we've been on this a lot. So I think that's where that question stems from. So how is education going to change in light of you know, lockdowns and distance learning. I think that's the professor's question. I'll take that one. I would like to make a comment also about the multilateral institutions since okay. it's so in international relations. Uh, and, and two things is on education. Obviously, I think the countries who will have a digital, you know, a digitalized economy or more conditions uh, to do that, that's something that probably will, uh, there are kind of, you know, uh, getting over it faster. And it's interesting that in Germany, despite being a very developed country, uh, this, it's still not so, there are many kids, they don't have access to computers. Uh, you know, teachers are not used to the technologies. Uh, so it's not a very digital country, paradoxically. So that's very interesting because this, this is driving the whole, you know, they have to change everything that they knew about education systems. So, so that's something that is happening right now here. Um, on social discipline. But one point that I think is very important about this education, it's like when you say that you have to, this problems uh, require systems thinking, it's how you also teach people about that. How do we tackle this pandemic problem? Is it just a health sector issue? I don't believe so. So it's really have to, how to bring this 
problems of, of planetary health to the business sector, for example, uh, on the issue of externalities, of course, but how much do we talk about this uh, when you're, you know, teaching uh, in, in, in economics? Uh, economics, we teach that, but I'm saying in business schools. So uh, I do believe that we need to be there and there are examples. Uh, for example, in Wales, we have people here in university they were like breaking their faculties to make it in a more uh, holistic understanding of, of things. So that's a, a very important thing and it's a movement that I've been seeing. Uh, and on the multilateral institutions, that's a very important point because we do have, uh, despite being a local need that we need to tackle that, you still, you, can't, you can have this illusion that is not a global problem that we are facing, especially with this connectivity. Perhaps we're going to see a, a process of deglobalization slowly, slowly, uh, at least now for sure. We have 98% of travel bookings that were uh, canceled, so we are like just 2% happening. Uh, 12 passengers per plane, I think, in the US. That's, uh, you know, uh, that's very unprecedented. And so I think we're not going back to normal, just as at least definitely not in a few years, not of course, the, if we have a vaccine, and, and as we know, 18 months is very optimistic, this will probably change. But I don't believe we should go back to this, the new normal because the past normal was also not uh, precisely good. So we do need to, I, I believe there are top-down approach that you need the multilateral institutions to coordinate these actions. And of course, you need a very much uh, empowered uh, civil society to take uh, leadership roles in local institutions. Thank you. Yes. Sir. So, so again, uh, my comments sort of split between focusing on the current crisis and thinking about long-term issues. Mm -hmm. uh, on the current crisis, I just don't think we can maintain strong uh, isolation and distancing over five years. That that just is not feasible for our society. So, uh, we will most likely uh, cr either succeed on Plan A and crush this uh, soon, or have to go to a Plan B and most people get infected over the coming year after which we can go back to our usual ways if we want to, and we'll probably want to because the world is relatively lazy and, and stuck in its ways. But I, I think it's worth thinking about, in my book, The Elephant in the Brain, we talk about education as one of our chapters. And basically, we don't go to school for the reason we claim. We claim to go to school because we learn the material. We don't actually learn that much, and that's not why we go to school. We mostly go to school to show off and, and cult get acculturated and get doc propaganda and all those other sorts of things. And so that's why you know, people will probably want to continue with something like education, even when it's not very you know, effective in terms of teaching you things. And part of the signal so far has been a signal of joining a culture and being acculturated in a community and you do that by being in person mostly so far. And I expect that people will want to go back to that uh, as soon as they can, which they probably can because this will be over in a year. Another question that has come up, and this is related to the Dean's question, is what are, who are going to be the new leaders under this uh, crisis? We begin to see a divergence between national leaders, local leaders. We see this in the United States as well as here in Brazil. Uh, so who are the new leaders? Should I? That's a very interesting question. And I think we, uh, and I think it actually could be anyone. Huh? And this is a, the interesting part that before you probably need all these credentials or, or I do think we go to, I mean, that would, I'm definitely interested. I haven't read your book, Professor, but I'm interested in this. I'm sure it's part of the community, but we do also go to school in education because we need to, to deal with complexity. And uh, one of the issues that we have now is that with this digital world, what is the impact that we can have right now? You know, we're all sitting in different places and we can start movements. And I think the nature of social movements are probably changing. So the next new leader, you know, we had recently a 16 year old a girl uh, coming from uh, Sweden. Uh, and then this, who could be the next? Anyone that who could actually have, I think is the way we are expanding how we give voice to people. Uh, and there are many issues uh, on that, of course, but uh, it's the possibilities uh, that the formal, the way we do politics is probably what is changing the most, and also even what it means to be democratic. And so one thing that I'm very concerned that we didn't have time maybe to discuss so much is like what it means for our democracies, uh, uh, you know, this whole this disruption and even especially in the United States, problems with cybersecurity, and that's also, of course, very much connected to technology. Uh, those are the themes that we're probably going to have to 
think about because if everything becomes so fragmented and, and the leaders will be probably pose of leadership, how do we do that collectively? So this is the very important question. So I'd say this is still enormously up in the air because we're still mid crisis. If you look back at past major crises in history in your nation or in the world, we tend to tell stories about what was the key problem and who were the winners or the heroes and who were the villains. And that greatly influences the following institutions and the kinds of people who are seen as desirable leaders at, after the time. But if you might realize if you, before the crisis, it's much harder to tell what that final story will be. We're still in the point where people are struggling to decide who are the heroes and villains in this story. And they are fighting over this narrative of what will have been the solution and who were the people opposing it. When we finally settle on that narrative, it may not be close to the truth. It may just not be what really happened. You will have lived through it and you will have a better sense of it than generations later when they tell the stories back, but it's still up in the air. It, we are still choosing and creating this narrative because very few people have actually been infected so far. And if most people eventually get infected, we have most of the story ahead of us of how that happens and who is blamed and who helped to prevent it. Thank you very much. There's a question from Professor Carolina Riso from the Development uh, uh, Postgraduate Program. And her question, I'm pretty sure it's directed to Professor Hansen. It's about artificial intelligence. And her, as you can see in the chat, is she's asking about the ethics of in artificial intelligence uh, currently and what kind of solutions does it provide to our problems such as corruption, development, etc. I don't necessarily think there is that much connection between ethics and AI per se and that ethics is an important thing and we need to think about ethics and we need to apply our ethics, but it doesn't change that much in the context of AI. Neither does it change the context of most of the particular things. Ethics and electricity isn't that different. Ethics and telephones isn't that different. You just need to have an ethics and apply it. Uh, so for AI, you need to think about what are the key big problems that will occur and how could we deal with them? And then you might ask, what are the ethics of dealing with that problem? So I would say for the short-term AI, we already have been dealing with it in a satisfactory way for many decades. There are ways we could improve that in terms of how we deal with job displacement and people losing their abilities and skills and having to learn new things, but uh, I don't see any particular ethical crises there. Eventually, however, there'll be this huge disruption, and the question is, how do we handle that huge disruption? I recommend that we set up insurance programs <laughs> that pay out when robots take all the jobs. <laughs> So that is the key risk at some point, perhaps without much warning, maybe only five years warning, all of a sudden robots will take all the jobs. Then all of a sudden people who don't have jobs and any other source of income will be in deep trouble. And of course, there's a key question, what do we do about that? But since we are well before that date, the right thing to do is to set up insurance. That is prepare ahead of time and agree on who gets paid what uh, and pay premiums for that. So we could, create collective social insurance, and that might be okay. Cities and nations could set up insurance programs, but you personally should maybe not trust them to do that for you. And maybe you should set up private family personal insurance, even for your employees in a firm, to deal with this prospect. What if employees, what if robots take all the jobs? And if there is sufficient insurance, and we have sufficient warning certainly to set them up, and at the moment, if you started to buy this insurance, the premiums would be quite cheap because the risk is very low anytime soon. That solves most of the ethical problems with respect to people being in deep trouble if robots take all the jobs. Can I say something on that? Please. It's a, perhaps a question and I find it's fascinating because that's uh, AI is a topic everybody's interested in. But on the ethics, what is uh, important is that still the technology is still being, for now, being built by humans, right? And humans, we are prone to biases, right? And uh, when you see, for example, um, on the recognition of faces, when you have, for example, women of color saying they were not being recognized the system and, 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 and this is something that when these people are trying to build the next generation of the technology uh, I would like to see your view because one of the to know what you think is that uh, what is important on this whatever technology we're trying to, talk, uh, to build is the diversity of voices and people you know uh, constructing uh, this so they're not excluded so we don't reproduce the same biases that we have in society in terms of inequalities and discrimination I'm sure you've come across that discussion, but I'd be interested to hear your, your opinions on that. So, so again, uh, there are certainly issues of bias and ethics of bias. 
but they aren't that different when you think about AI. They are still the same basic issues of bias that we have even without AI. So for example, in the United States, we have this system of credit scores uh, where uh, you get a credit score based on your uh, purchasing and uh, borrowing activity and when you repay, and this credit score influences whether you can get a loan, whether you can get rented by a landlord, whether you get a job. These credit scores have many potential biases and they are relatively opaque. We, most people don't know where their score comes from or what formula is computed, yet we have this score and it's used widely. We of course have scores like the SAT exams. We have lots of other scores that use the educational systems. We have long had opaque scores and systems that produce estimates that then influence people's outcomes. And there are many issues with those systems, but AI doesn't, cha doesn't change those issues. AI is just another way to produce scores, uh, but it retains all of the promise and potential problems of making systems by which people are scored or recognized or counted or any other sorts of things. We, we've, you know, we've had these problems for a very long time and we continue to have them. I mean, even, even say just having an ID card is a score system and there can be biases with ID cards. What if some people don't have them? And we already have the debate, should you be allowed to vote if you don't have an ID card, right? That's a debate about a system of identification and whether or not it's biased. That's an old issue. The AI doesn't really change it that much. Okay, I don't. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this ongoing. Uh, AI is going to be an ongoing issue and even more so uh, today as we are under different forms of lockdowns and distancing. Uh, I'm going to leave this to Maite and to Carolina to close uh, our session for today. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us today and for your time. I'm going to hand over to Maite and to Carolina. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Isana. Um, all of the, our two great panelists. It's really um, one of the, I guess, opportunities. There's so, so many, you know, problems, challenges right now in our current situation. But an opportunity mm -hmm. is having this kind of encounter. And I just want to say one other kind of thing in the very beginning. Um, you talked about collaboration, and it, I guess in these kind of strange times, in a way, collaboration could become a little bit, you know, more easier to engage in. So um, I think we're left with some um, really great food for thought, but also actual kind of opportunities for more collaboration with, with, with you. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Hansen, for all your very just interesting um, uh, ideas, as always. Um, and thank you so much. It's not the, as Isana said in the beginning, you've joined us in a few occasions to, you know, shed light in all these issues for their students. And it's just very much appreciate it. Here in Colombia, sometimes we're kind of isolated from, you know, from, from these kind of opportunities. So thank you for being here. And um, yeah, thanks for your time. I don't know if Carolina wants to. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Nicole, Professor Nicole and Professor Hansel. Thank you for the time of the participants. It's a very interesting discuss discussion that uh, all the world it's talking about. And thank you for being with us, with the university and for the faculty. Thank you for your time. Okay, we'll have a great day, everyone, great wherever, day. or great uh, afternoon, evening um, yeah. in Germany. Uh, rest of the day of almost midday for you, uh, Professor Hansen, and for us, we are kind of in the middle of the morning. So morning. have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thank, thank you very thank much you for, for your participation. Time. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.